When I was a kid, I wanted to be an architect. So tell me, what did you want to be? A firefighter, a nurse, a What? As a kid? What else? What else? Shout it so the entire world can hear it. A dolphin. That's beautiful. So I wanted to be an architect. And I got this really, really cool kit, right? And it had, it had that graphic chart paper on it. You know the, the graph paper that has little squares? Oh, and I fell in love with that paper for the rest of my life. I use it, and I take notes all the time. But I had that paper, and I would design my world, right? I would design my buildings, and I would design my roller rinks. I had multiple roller rinks in my world. I would design my indoor jungles. <laughs> what? And then I would design these like massive, huge houses with like 14 rooms and ramps so I could like roller skate everywhere, and then realizing afterwards that they really only had two windows. So I learned, OK, maybe I need to go and get trained for this. And then I realized that's not even ar what architects do. So it really wasn't that being an architect is what I wanted to do. It was that I wanted to create my own world. That's what I wanted. Because even in fourth grade, even in fourth grade, I knew that the world where I was, this world, was not a world for everybody. I wanted a world where I saw people who looked like me, who had names like mine, who spoke languages that I heard at home. I wanted to see them on TV. I wanted to see them as lawyers. I wanted to see them when I had to go to the doctor's office. I wanted to see them teaching me. That wasn't the case. So why did you want to be what you wanted to be? Think about that. Why did you want to, who said dolphin? <laughs> why did you want to be a dolphin? Yeah. Love the water, wanted to swim. Maybe, maybe this ground that we're having to walk on just wasn't for you, right? So you wanted to go somewhere else. So when I was preparing my remarks for today, remarks, sounds so official, I struggled with kind of what to say. I was like, oh my gosh, OK, so breaking boundaries and uh, Latina leadership and and then I realized, OK, well, that in itself is breaking boundaries. Hello. <laughs> so then I thought, OK, so maybe I can talk about how amazing and awesome and wonderful having Latinas in leadership is for our world and our community. And yeah. But then I realized, OK, I also need to talk about the realities of Latinas in leadership. The realities that there are Latinas that, that advance into leadership roles, like CEOs of companies. There's very few. Executive directors of organizations, again, that's very few. There are Latinas that you know, serve in amazing, powerful leadership opportunities and leadership capacities doing community organizing, doing things that aren't in the public eye, doing things that don't bring in the big dollars. But they're not recognized. Then I started thinking, oh, wait a minute. What is leadership? Uh, OK, this is a daunting task. Thank you, Daphna. So what exactly is leadership? Why do we call someone a leader? Is it because uh, they walk 10 steps and we follow? If I were to tell you all, stand up. If you are able to stand up, please stand up. Would you stand up? <laughs> I got one. <laughs> so does that make me a leader? Yeah, OK, yes. Yeah, yes, it does. And it doesn't. So we often think of leaders in our history as Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King, JFK, Dolores Huerta, Audre Lorde, Gloria Steinem. But there are figures that were out there, right? There were figures that were in the public eye. They were figures that gave the speeches. They were the ones that took the photos. They were the ones that, that shook the hands. They were, you know, they were the ones that were out there. But they were also the ones that experienced a lot of the hatred. They were the ones that, 
got a lot of the retaliation. They, had, they received death threats. They got bricks in the windows. They were spit on in the streets, and they were called hateful and derogatory names. Another thing that's not often spoke about in leadership is those who stood right by those who we call leaders. Only recently has Dolores Huerta actually been, become a known name in American society households. But did you know that Si Se Puede? How many of you have heard of Si Se Puede? Yeah, right? Si Se Puede, ah, let's go. <laughs> si Se Puede is actually hers, yeah. Dolores Huerta coined that term, but we all credit Cesar Chavez. Did you also know that Dolores Huerta was the one that actually led the Farm Workers Union when it was established? Yeah, it was Dolores Huerta. Did you know that she did all this with 11 kids? <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. Si se puede, right? Whew. So another thing about Dolores Huerta is that she had a stronger, deeper understanding of humanity. Why? Because she had more mountains that she had to climb. So what about our Latina leaders of today? Well, we have Latina leaders who are elected to lead us, right? We have seven amazing Latinas that are in Congress. How many Congress members do we have? Come on, shout it out. Take a guess. 535. Other guesses. 54. Keep guessing. Come on. OK, don't guess. We, had 430, we have 435. House of Representatives in Congress. Do you know what that means? That means that we have 0.01% Latinas that are representing us up there. How is that reflective of our society and of our country? It's not. It's flat out, it's just not. What does that mean when we are creating policy that affects each and every one of us? What does that mean when I have to entrust individuals who have no idea what my experience is to make policy for me? I tell you, it's scary as hell. Of the 90 notable Hispanic Americans, I'm, I'm quoting because there's like this list of 90 notable American, Hispanic Americans, 11 of them are women. <laughs> that's, you know, that's better you know, better percentage. But these 11 consist of the seven who are in Congress, the three women who have been appointed to serve in the federal government, and one is a singer, Joan Baez. Oh. So what about the people that aren't singers, right? Can, uh, I'll try, <clears throat> just kidding. What about those that aren't running for office? What about those that aren't appointed? So why am I talking about all this? Because if I'm going to be up here talking about Latina leadership, I want to talk about the amazing contributions that Latinas have, but I also want to talk about the barriers that are in place to have Latinas actually serve in leadership. What are those barriers? Where do they come from? Who put them there? You put them there. I put them there. They're there. So how do we break them down? So there are, three, there are three things that I, me, myself, Lorena Garcia, believe about leadership. One, no leader does it alone. Two, that a leader is born. Three, that a leader follows. Now next to every leader is somebody who they guide there's somebody who guides them. There's somebody who they trust. They have a mentor. That's people that push them. It's people that challenge them. It's people that question them and support them. A leader is born, right? We are all, we all have leadership in us. But it's about identifying those opportunities to step up. It's about identifying those opportunities to say, I don't agree with this, or I agree with this, and I'm going to take it and run. And then a leader follows. If a leader doesn't listen, we just, we just heard, we just saw this amazing presentation about listening. If a leader doesn't listen, if somebody does not listen and understand the true needs of what has to change, then how are they really a leader? They're not, they're a freaking dictator. <sighs> so with these three rules, I like to call them rules because if you're not following the rules, you can't play the game. <laughs> we can look at successful leaders who are in leadership. I, I'm going to lean, yeah? OK. We can look at successful leaders who are in leadership, 
and they follow these rules. So these are leaders who I consider powerful, so they're the young people that I work with. They're the organizers in the communities that create the opportunities for community members in the community to, to grow. They're the teachers who listen to the needs, and they're also elected officials who truly represent their communities. Those are people who I consider leaders. Now leaders are people that are very inspiring, people look up to them, they're considered honorable, but leaders also experience a lot of backlash, right? If they make one decision, one decision that people don't agree with, then everyone turns their back on them. Right, Obama? They are, <clears throat> there's a catch-22 with being brown and being a woman, right? Because if you're assertive in a meeting, then you're just some crazy, loud, angry brown woman. <laughs> if you're not assertive, then you're just bending over. Catch-22. So I want to take us back to those that are unsung, the heroes that are unsung. And the leader that I really want to highlight is my mom. Yes, my mom. Ah! My amazing and powerful mother, she's a leader in her own right, but I promise you if you ask her, she will say, I'm not a leader, I just love what I do. She's an elementary school teacher, and in her career, she's done amazing things. So she has fought for culturally competent curricula, she has fought for diversity training for teachers in schools, and she's also, she's fought for incorporating experiential programs in her, in her elementary school. She's done so much, but she hasn't done any of this alone. She did it with parents. She did it with the students. You know, she listened to the need. She's amazing, and I look up to her. When I was growing up, my mom would say that her daughters have two mountains to climb, one because they're Latina and one because they're a woman. When I came out of the closet, surprise, I'm gay. When I came out of the closet, she went to one of my older sisters and said, my baby now has three mountains to climb. But my sister, Laura, she told her very gently and calmly, and she said, Mom, don't worry about her, because she's already conquered those mountains. I share this story because in our society, when you're part of a marginalized community, either because of your gender, or race, or class, or sexual orientation, or physical ability, or anything, right? Others often see that as a barrier. We sometimes see that as an obstacle. But I can tell you that our leaders don't use their identity as an obstacle or a barrier. They use it as opportunity. So my mountains, sure, they're kind of big. <laughs> Looking at them is kind of overwhelming. But I strap on my snowboard, I grab my friends, we hike up together those really rough mountains, we jump on my snowboard, and together we cruise down, and we make those mountains a kick butt time. And that is what we have to do. So we look at boundaries and we say, when we look at barriers and we look at obstacles, yeah. We can look at those and kind of stand back and say, oh, oh. Or we can figure out really fun, awesome, and creative ways to overcome those. Thank you. <laughs>